The Blessed Eucharist, Our Greatest Treasure, by Father Michael Mueller. Chapter 2 On the Reverence Due to Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament. Young Portuguese traveled to India to seek his fortune. In a few years, he returned to Europe, accompanied by several of his own vessels, laden with wealth, the fruits of his toil and researches. Having arrived at his native place, Stay said to himself, I must play a little deception on my relations. He put on soiled garments and a torn cloak and hastened to the house of his cousin Peter. In this disguise, he claimed relationship. I am your cousin John, said he. I have passed several years in India. I now return to visit my friends and native land once more. You see my position, and thus by ties of kindred, I crave hospitality at your hands. Ah, would to heaven I could accommodate you, my dear John, replied Peter. Excuse me, my house is wholly occupied. John, playing his role, proceeds to another friend's house, makes the same advance, realizes the same reply, and thus to a third and fourth. His poverty-stricken appearance has thus driven him from door to door. Ah, poor deluded friends, little did you imagine that under that tattered garment a man of wealthy, of wealth laid concealed. John hastened back to his ships, cast aside his beggar's dress, robed himself in costly at attire, and followed by a and followed by a multitude of servants, proceeded at once to purchase a princely dwelling in the very heart of the city. His fabulous wealth, his lordly retinue, his high-blooded steeds, were the talk of the town and neighborhood. The news soon reached the ears of his friends. Picture to yourselves, if you can, their wondrous amazement. How changed would their conduct now be if the opportunity could be present, could present, but it present itself anew? Listen to the altered tone of their language. What is the meaning of all this? said one to the other. Could you have supposed this for a moment? Had I but known this before, my friend would have met with very different treatment at my hands. But alas, it is now too late. We have repulsed him forever. The foregoing story serves as an illustration of what takes place between Christians and their Lord. This man went to his friends as a beggar, attired in poor, tattered garments, disguising thus his affluence and power. In the holy sacrifice of the Mass, does not our blessed Lord act in the same manner? Does he, while silently remaining enclosed in our tabernacles, by day and by night, display his heavenly glory and brightness? No, but he there remains, as it were, in a poor, miserable dress, under the humble appearance of bread, this stranger came to his friends a second time in rich and royal attire, escorted by numerous attendants. Jesus Christ will come again at the end of the world, enthroned on the clouds of heaven, in great power and majesty. Myriads of angels and blessed spirits will surround him on every side, for wealth, glory, and power are his. To whom can we compare those unkind friends of our narrative? Unfortunately, to a very great number of Christians of the present day. How is that, you will ask me, perhaps? 
because as they paid little or no attention to their relative in his poverty, so in the same manner a great many Christians pay little or no reverence to Jesus Christ when humbly concealed in the sacrament of his love. After this conduct of Christians, let us not be astonished if we hear of infidels or heretics treading our Lord with the reverence in the Holy Eucharist. Once a Jewish pushed her temerity and hardiness so far as to receive Holy Communion with the Christians. Her audacity was immediately detected although when she had received the sacred host, she bowed down most profoundly, covering her face with her hands, as though wrapped in the purest devotion. Well, you will say, how did she betray herself? Those who were near her noticed that she was keeping the sacred host in her mouth and treating it with reverence, irreverence. She acted thus in order to ridicule and dishonor Jesus Christ, the God of the Christians. The observers of this conduct concluded that she must be either a sorceress or, as it really was the case, an unbelieving Jewess. In what does her conduct differ from that of many people of our day? Do we not see men who hardly bow their head, much less bend their knee when passing before the most august sacrament? Women enter the church who by their dress and thoughtlessness cannot claim any high prerogative of the, in the immodesty of their sex. Men even grant full liberty to their wanton gaze, heedless of the penetrating eye of their God who fills that temple, and whose sight has already pierced their souls. When at processions intended to honor the Blessed Sacrament, I see such behavior, I must conclude that this is the result of the most complete indifference toward Jesus Christ, or a total forgetfulness of his presence. What then shall I call these persons? Jews? Shall I call them sorcerers? No, but I think I shall not be far astray in saying that they have not a lively faith. They may be Catholics, if you will, but certainly their faith is not practical. They do not realize that Jesus Christ is present in the tabernacle and in the remonstrance. They are deceived by their senses. In the remonstrance, or in the hands of the priest at Mass, they see nothing but the white host, and their thoughts penetrate no farther. But if they only reflected on what their faith teaches, that under that little host, Jesus Christ conceals his heavenly splendor and glory, how different would be their deportment? How different their thoughts and feelings. Would you know how they would act if their faith was real and lively? Go to the place of a king. Mark the silent expectation in that splendid apartment. What mean those movements so circumspect? That tread so noiseless? That voice so subdued? Ah, tis the royal antechamber. There, a loud word is an impertinence. There, unbecoming attire is a crime. But hark, even the stealthy conversation is hushed. Every eye is turned to one point. Each one assumes the most respectful attitude. The curtain is drawn and the obe obs obsequious courtiers stand in the presence of their king. What an unpardonable breach of decorum would it not be for anyone 
to remain standing at a moment like this. Yes, to talk, to laugh, or to remain with head covered. Now, if such honor is paid to earthly princes, what reverence is not then due to him who is King of kings and Lord of lords? St. John Chrysostom is indignant with us for even making the comparison, and it is, it is with reason. For what is an emperor, emperor when compared to the King of heaven and earth? He is less than a blade of grass when compared to the whole universe. Whenever the Blessed Sacrament is exposed in the tabernacle, borne in procession or carried as viaticum to the sick, whenever the sacred host is raised at the consecration in the Mass, our infallible faith says to us, Ece Rex Vester, Behold your King. Behold your Redeemer, your Judge, your Creator, your God. If then, in the presence of the most blessed sacrament, I feel no devotion interiorly, and show no modesty exteriorly, what will you think of me? You will say with truth and justice that that man does not believe that his God is present there, or again, that man's faith is cold and dead. Who could believe that Jesus Christ is present in this sacrament and fail in reverence toward it? What reverence did not the Jews pay for to the Ark of the Covenant? No one dared approach it. Yet 50,000 persons who through curiosity ventured to gaze thereat were struck dead as a punishment for their rash act. Yet what did the ark contain? A golden pot that had manna, and the rod of Aaron that had blossomed, and the tables of the covenant. But in the Holy Eucharist, faith tells us that God himself is present. He who made all things out of nothing, and could destroy them in a moment. He who, at the last day, will come on the clouds of heaven to judge the living and the dead. Only let Catholics believe this with a lively faith, and our churches will be filled with worshippers whose deportment will correspond to their belief. The modest attire, the guarded eye, the bended knee, the meekly folded hands, will bespeak of conviction of their hearts. Only let Catholics have a lively faith in this mystery, and Jesus Christ will seldom be left alone. At all hours, his children will come to present themselves before him, as subjects before their prince, as sick men before their physician, as children before their father, in a word, as friends before their beloved friend. Only let a congregation be animated with the lively faith of this doctrine of our holy religion, and each mind will be filled with amazement, the spirit will be recollected, the soul moved to contrition, the affections inflamed, the eye melted to tears of tenderness, and the voice broken with sighs like those of the poor publican. O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner." or like unto that of St. Peter, Lord, retire from me, for I am a sinful man. Thus reference is nothing more than a lively faith. The reality of the divine presence in the de blessed sacrament is the true rule of our deportment before it. The Catholic has within himself the rule of decorum, he needs nothing else to teach him what is proper or improper in church, besides the dogma that assures him that he is in the presence of God. If then he be but a little recollected, he will be almost necessarily respectful. 
This, then, is the great means of preserving a reverence, a reverent deportment, to remember who he is that is enclosed in the tabernacle and what we are, that our divine Savior is in our midst and that we are his creatures and subjects come to worship him. But although our faith is sufficient to teach us how we ought to behave before our Lord, yet because it is sometimes difficult to keep in mind the truths of the faith, and because examples are always more powerful than a bare precept, I will set before you some striking examples, which may serve to impress upon your mind the duty of reverence toward the blessed sacrament. First, I will propose the example of the angels. St. Basil and St. Chrysostom testify to having seen at the time of Mass many hosts of angels in human form, clothed with white garments and standing around the altar as soldiers, stand before their king. But what was their attitude and deportment? Their heads were bowed, their faces covered, their hands crossed, and the whole body so profoundly inclined as to express the deepest sense of their own unworthiness to appear before the divine majesty. Oh, would we but think of this, the angels whose those pure spirits shrink before the infinite holiness of God, and we allow vain, worldly, and even sinful thoughts to insinuate themselves into our mind in his presence. The angels tremble before his greatness, and we fear not to talk and laugh in his presence. The angels, those princes of heaven, are all humility and modesty, and we, the dust of the earth, and miserable sinners, all in pertinence and pride. The angels veil their faces before his splendor, and we do not even so much as cast down our eyes, but rudely stare and gaze around. The angels bow down to the earth, and we will not bend our knees. The angels, full of awe, fold their hands upon their breast, and we allow ourselves every freedom of attitude and movement. Oh, what a subject of confusion! What humiliating reflections! What an impressive lesson! Secondly, I will take you from the princes of heaven to the princes of the earth and teach you a lesson from the example of kings and nobles. There are many beautiful examples on record of the homage that kings and emperors have paid to the Savior of mankind, so humbly hidden in the Blessed Sacrament. Philip II, King of Spain, always dispensed with regal pomp and pageantry, when he assisted at possession of the Blessed Sacrament, and as an ordinary personage mingled with the common throng. Inclemency of weather deterred him not from paying this tribute of honor to our Lord. One day, as he was devoutly accompanying the Blessed Sacrament with uncovered head, a page held his hat over him to shield him from the burning sun. Never mind, said Philip, the sun will do me no harm. At such time as this, we must regard neither rain nor wind, heat nor cold. On another occasion, occasion, whilst the Blessed Sacrament was being carried a great distance to a sick person, Philip accompanied it all the way on foot. The priest, observing this, asked him if he were not tired. Tired, replied he, behold, my servants wait upon me both by day and by night, and never yet have I heard one of them complain of being tired. Shall I then complain of fatigue when I am waiting upon my Lord and my God 
whom I can never sufficiently serve and honor? <laughs> 